Hi, and thanks for watching. Welcome to this lesson of the AP Comparative Government course. Uh, these videos are based on the books written by Patrick H. O'Neill. They're the fourth edition. Um, just for reference value, they're the red, blue, and orange books, and they're printed by Norton. Uh, just as a disclaimer, these videos are by no means a substitute for the course. If you are taking a course, kudos to you. That's amazing. Um, I love the course, and that's the reason why I'm making these videos, is to help other people um, who are going to be studying the course, you know, just to make some videos and give them a quick summary, you know, in case they want to watch it before the test or something. I mean, that would have helped me a lot. Um, so this is the first lesson, and we will be doing the introduction. So without much further ado, let's begin. So there's several different ways analysis uh, study different countries. The first way is the comparative method, um, and it's really just how it sounds. Different countries are juxtaposed against each other. Through this way, scholars hope to find general similarities and conclusions. For instance, we could compare Soviet Russia with modern-day communist China. Um, the inductive method is the second method, and that's where we go from studying a case uh, to generating a hypothesis about the case. For instance, let's take the Russian Revolution. We could conclude that extreme poverty was the cause of the revolution. This is a good way to build a foundation on a study and can later be expanded. However, a single country uh, cannot supply enough evidence. You would need to go to other countries such as France, look at their revolutions, uh, look at the Glorious Revolution in England, etc. Uh, the deductive method is kind of the opposite. It starts with a hypothesis and then seeks out the evidence. For instance, the hypothesis revolutions occur when there is extreme poverty. Uh, for Russia, this may be the case. The Tsars were extremely oppressive, and the serfs were super poor. Um, but what about other revolutions? What about the American Revolution? Uh, America had Boston and New York. They were poor farmers, but they were definitely not as bad off as the serfs. Um, and what about all the republics of France? So by carrying out these studies, we may eventually find a correlation or apparent link between certain factors and variables. Or, in fact, we may find a cause-and-effect relationship which is also known as a casual relationship. Unfortunately, all of these methods are very difficult for a lot of reasons. The first is that there is no way to control variables for study. I mean, it's countries. You can't control the variables in the country. Um, it's also impossible to isolate the variables because they're so interlinked with each other. Not only that, but due to policy changes and social upheavals, variables change. The second reason is that many of these variables are also interconnected. The changing of one can totally remove or drastically modify another. As well, normally multiple variables are at work for a single policy or event. There is rarely an easy cause and effect relationship, though it does happen. The third problem we have is that we are limited in our information sources. After all, we only have about 200 cases to study, um, and there are new countries appearing all the time, and there are old countries disappearing. For instance, as I'm recording this, Russia is invading Ukraine. No one knows what's going to happen. Um, could Ukraine disappear? Probably not, but definitely an autonomous Crimean state might emerge, which that would change the geography and the political spectrum of Europe. Um, the fourth issue we will encounter are practical limits. Um, and these are language barriers, cash, and how much the government reveals about specific information. It might be hard to get information about Tiananmen Square, primary sources about Tiananmen Square in China, for example. Um, and this is a huge factor because a lot of good political scientists simply don't have the time or ability to know several different languages. If you want to study sino russo um, relations, you would need to know Russian and Chinese. And if you're an American, that means you need to know three languages and be fluent in them and have security clearance to the documents in both countries. Fifth is very important. Um, you can have a study bias. This can be an area bias where you only study, let's say, Scandinavian or Asian nations um, as opposed to South African nations and such. In fact, most research today is done not on Asia, which you would think because of its economic boom, but on Western Europe. We still have that going on today. Others fall into a selection bias, which is choosing to study nations that you agree with politically or speak the same language. For instance, 
Americans would prefer to study um, United Kingdom stuff or even French stuff, stuff that is more Western, more European, more um, would have more stuff in English. Sixth is the cause and effect. Um, well, frequent in other sciences, this is very rare in this field. As I said before, it doesn't happen a lot, and it makes things very confusing, and often variables feed off of each other. All right, now let's take a look at a few people who have been major political scientists. In fact, the very first was a Greek man, Aristotle. He was the first to study comparative politics and separate them from philosophy. He wrote the book, The Politics, and advocated a practical study of the field. Machiavelli uh, was an Italian during the Renaissance. He emphasized the statesmanship and analyzed different political systems. He discussed his somewhat oppressive theories in his book, The Prince. In fact, he was the one that said, it is greater to be feared than it is to be loved. Um, Thomas Hobbes advocated a Leviathan state, a large government, as opposed to other theories that would occur throughout the time um, that would advocate small governments. He said that the people should give up some of their liberties in return for security. This was known as a social contract and was written in his book, The Leviathan. Uh, John Locke was the exact opposite of Hobbes and said that private property is essential to individual prosperity and freedom. He advocated a weak state in his book, The Treaties of Government. In fact, um, he is very important in American political culture. Montesquieu, another influential person in American culture, uh, was a Frenchman who proposed a separation of branches of government, and he wrote the book The Spirit of the Laws. Rousseau is a French philosopher who said that the citizens' rights were inalienable and could not be taken from the state. He was a major influence in civil rights and discussed his ideas in the social contract. Karl Marx is a very controversial person simply because of his radical ideas that he wrote in his book Das Kapital and his writing of the Communist Manifesto. Um, he said that the proletariat, the working class, would eventually rise up against the bourgeoisie, which was the upper class, and eventually capitalism would fall. So far, that has not proven to be true. Max Weber wrote on the forms of bureaucracy and the forms of authority. He discussed how they affected economic and political development in his book, Economy and Society. He is one of the more modern uh, political scientists along with Marx. Okay, so let's talk about institutions. Institutions are organizations that are valued for their own sake and self-perpetuating. These are the stage for political behavior and they generate norms and values in a country. They are legitimate and command some authority. They can include things like the NFL and the voting day in America and something like hockey in Canada. Um, in fact, gay rights is not an institution in Russia, whereas gay rights may very well be an institution in the United States and is definitely, if not, most certainly an institution now in Western Europe. Um, these can also include things like democracy and authoritarianist regimes. In fact, there's even a theory that only the West is able to have democracy because of its institutions. Asia is not allowed to have democracy because of its old Confucianist um, ideology. However, one simply has to look at stuff like South Korea, um, special economic zones in China, Singapore, and Japan. That theory is very loosely uh, held together. Institutions um, are loaded with politics, um, and vice versa. Some organizations will even take a specific side. For instance, the United States NRA is far more right-wing and will support right-wing um, officials and politicians. Other examples of institutions are the army, the police, and the legislature. And right here on the screen, um, formal institutions are based on officially sanctioned law and informal, unwritten, and unofficial laws. Lastly, in this chapter, we're going to touch on freedom and equality. Freedom is the ability to do what you want, and equality is the standard of living. Um, equalized. Politics are filled with the question, what is more important, freedom or equality? In capitalism, freedom is emphasized. You can have many rights to do what you want, but some may get hurt and there will be large income gaps. For instance, the United States has the highest freedom, but also the highest income inequality. This was prevalent during the American and British Industrial Revolutions. In fact, this 
high inequality is what spurred um, Karl Marx to write Das Kapital in the Communist Manifesto. Communism, on the other hand, puts all emphasis on equality, and everyone has relatively the same lifestyle. Um, as we know from communist countries, that tends to be poor. Ideally, all would be rich or middle class. However, like I said, in all cases, it's pretty much all poor except for a very small oligarchy of elites. And eventually there's the mixed socialism, which is found in most Western European countries, and this is the balance between equality and freedom. Thanks for watching. I hope you do well with your tests and your studying, and I hope you'll subscribe, and please watch the next video when it's time for your next lesson. Have a good day.